Hello, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of the MCTAC team, I would like to welcome and thank you for tuning in today. My name is Ashley Fuss, and I am the Director of Evaluation here at the McSilver Institute, and I'm joined by my colleague, Chris, who is a MCTAC consultant. Chris, do you wish to say anything? Just to welcome everybody to this, this module and the, and the next one, module four, looking at the, uh, the assessment tool itself, and um, I look forward to hearing Ashley take us through this. Great, thank you. So today I'm going to be taking us through module three of our data beyond the tip of the iceberg series. And today's session is called looking in the data mirror, the importance of self-assessment. So today we're gonna to talk about a few things. First, we'll get started and talk a little bit about what is self-assessment, why self-assessment is important, and then go through quickly a little bit about what we know about self-assessment. So we'll talk about some things that we know from the research, and then I'll talk a little bit about some things that we've learned over the years of doing this self-assessment work with other organizations. I'll give a quick preview of the data gap assessment tool, and then go over briefly some tips for completing a self-assessment. So I chose this cartoon to start the discussion today and I'll just be quiet for a moment and let you read it. So I chose this cartoon because today we are going to be talking about self-assessment. And an important part of self-assessment is really taking a pause to reflect and not being afraid or disappointed at what we see or what we learn, right? We're all really busy people and we're always go, 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 go. So often taking a step back um, or a pause to assess how we are doing doesn't really come naturally to a lot of us. And in order to do so, we really have to make this conscious effort, this conscious decision to pause, right? It's also sometimes easier for us not to ask ourselves or not to do this work because if we don't know, then we can kind of right, keep pushing things under the rug um, and not have to use our energy to really work on these things. But I would always argue that knowing is better than not knowing. And in the long run, knowing our strengths and our weaknesses allows us to grow and be better. So as we talked today about self-assessment, I want you to remember that no one is perfect. And I think that there is always room to improve and to be better um, both personally and also in our work um, at our organizations. So what is organizational self-assessment? So there, right, there's a general agreement among experts in the organizational development kind of field that organizational self-assessment is a really valuable activity. Organizational self-assessments um, is a systematic process for obtaining information about organizational performance. And really through this process, um, we are able to kind of monitor what our processes are. And through learning this, we can make adjustments that help or enhance our performance. So assessment provides an opportunity for us um, or these work groups really to take a step back um, from these daily activities, right? Again, we're always so busy and doing things and go, go, go. So by really taking this kind of step back um, and being able to reflect, um, we're able to kind of understand what our strengths are and what kind of these areas of opportunities are for us. So why is self-assessment important? So conducting, conducting a self-assessment helps us or helps leadership answer some key and essential questions. So it can help answer questions on how are we doing? What are our strengths? And what are areas that really require some improvement or extra effort, or extra work? Um, this process is also really useful at helping us create a common language and a kind of an analytical framework. Um, it also helps us establish improvement priorities and really just provides a foundation um, for strategic planning and kind of making efforts at organizational change. So what makes a good self-assessment? So there are a few kind of key areas that the research um, has shown that really matter and make a good self-assessment. So things like conceptual domain, concreteness, diagnostic guidance, affiliation, and validity. And kind of when we were developing the self-assessment, these were all principles that were kind of part of our process or things that we thought about um, when creating it. So the first one, conceptual domain, really all that means is that the assessment should try to match the area that the organization is trying to understand or measure. 
And in this case, right, we're talking a lot about data and knowing what our strengths or weaknesses are at our organization around data. The next piece is really this concreteness. Um, and the, what we know is that the less, con the less abstract the concepts are, the qu are in the questions, the better, right? If you have a lot of room for interpretation or different, um, you know, a different way of looking at it, it gets really confusing and it doesn't give us the best results. Um, so we really try to be as concrete as possible when developing these questions. Diagnostic guidance really just means that assessments should help us understand what our strengths and what our weaknesses are, and then provide guidance for improvement. And this is something that we did um, when developing the tool. We um, tried really hard to make it clear and really um, pull out what the areas of strengths are and the areas of weakness, and then offer some hopefully helpful guidance around the areas that were weak. What are kind of some best next steps or action plan or things that you can do? Um, affiliation just means that um, a strong affiliation lends to more legitimacy of an assessment. Um, and over the years, we've you know, done a number of these OSAs, organizational self-assessments. Um, but it is important to just keep in mind when you are doing one, right, knowing kind of who it's coming from and who the developers are um, and kind of what their areas of expertise are. And the last one is validity. And all validity means is the degree to which the assessment is considered acceptable and provides accurate results, right? So is it measuring what it's supposed to be measuring? It doesn't make sense. So what do we know about self-assessments? So first we'll talk a little bit about what we know from the research. So the utility of a self-assessment really depends on how accurate and how good we are at self-judgment. So the accuracy, and we, we also know, is that why that it's really important, the accuracy of self-assessments is often flawed. Um, and what we find is that really, when it comes down to it, um, our assessments of ourselves or how good we are at things is really positively biased um, when we're asked to kind of rate our own performance or skills. And all that means is that we tend to think that we're a little bit better at things than we probably actually are. Um, I think that's just part of, right, human nature and the world that we live in. Um, and we also know that the ability to accurately assess ourselves um, really is kind of a key um, area and something that we call right, emotional intelligence. And all I mean by emotional intelligence um, is it's often defined in these different domains, right? So things like how self-aware we are, how well we are to self-manage, our social awareness, and really our relationship management. And kind of right, we know that emotional intelligence really does have an impact in both our like personal success and also in our you know professional success. So now we're going to go over some things that uh, we know about self-assessment um, from the research in the form of some trivia questions. And yes, you may notice that the theme of these pictures or memes for the next few slide next few slides do come from the Bachelor and Bachelorette. So for those of you who watch the show, I hope you enjoy them and my little anecdotes. And for those of you that do not watch, I still hope that you enjoy these little fun facts that you probably never cared to know. So the first question here for us to think about is emotionally intelligent people have the confidence of knowing what they're capable of and understanding their strengths and weaknesses. So true or false, give you a second to think about it. And we'll see that the answer is true. And for those of you who did watch Nick's season of The Bachelor, you may remember the little feud between Corinne and Taylor and Corinne not understanding what it meant to be emotionally intelligent um, and kept you know, obsessing over that she was a smart person. And just as a reminder, right, emotional intelligence has nothing to do uh, with how smart you are. It is a separate concept. So next we have true or false. Experience with self-assessment impacts accuracy. The first time you complete a self-assessment, the more accurate it is. True or false? The correct answer is false. What we actually know from the research is that the accuracy of self-perception often improves with experience. So in the research, accuracy is often improved the second time around or the second time that we kind of do things. And you'll see here a picture of Jaden Tanner, who found love the second time around on Bachelor in Paradise after they both got rejected on their first seasons of being on the show. So next we have true or false. Accuracy varies by gender. 
women are more likely to rate themselves more highly than men? And the answer to that is false. So we know from the research that men are actually more likely to rate themselves higher um, and tend to more frequently than women kind of overestimate their abilities um, on how good they are at things. And our little bachelor meme here is you may remember if you watched back in the day that this is Olivia and the thing she is probably best remembered for was her overconfidence um, and how well she connected with Bachelor Ben. And our final question, true or false, completion time can impact accuracy. Some studies have found that longer completion time results in lower accuracy. And that answer is true. So when it comes to self-assessment, it's really important not to overthink things, to go at your gut, and also to, you know, to try not to multitask and really just to focus on doing the assessment. And here you will see Rachel, who in my opinion is probably the best bachelorette in the history of the franchise because she was decisive and she trusted her gut and her first impression rose was given to her now husband. So now we'll just talk a little bit about some things that we've learned kind of over the years um, and some kind of adaptations or lessons learned um, from over the years of us kind of doing this work, right? So Mick Silver or Mick Tag has developed and conducted a number of OSAs really to help providers and government stakeholders assess organizational readiness um, for different things kind of over the years. So our own experience does actually map on to the research literature, especially as it relates to the points about, you know, questions being concrete and less subjective. And you may remember that if you've done any of our OSAs in the past, a lot of our responses um, or our response options have changed a bit. So we used to be much more um, subjective and have responses like strongly disagree, you know, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. And now we really tried to move past that and move towards more of this concrete, like, yes, I do it, we're working on it, or no, we are not. Um, so that's just something that we've kind of adapted and changed um, over the years kind of with our experience. Um, I think similarly, we also see that responses are often also um, positively biased, right? So organizations typically do rate themselves um, pretty high, especially as it relates to things around data capacity. And as you'll see here, um, these are just a sample of a few questions for that we've used over the years, right? Really asking about, you know, organizations' ability to implement different CQI projects, to be able to collect data, um, to, dem to demonstrate, you know, their clinical quality, their ability to really be able to show the impact. And on average, right, organizations tend to rate themselves pretty high and usually give themselves about a four um, or a five, a four out of five um, on a scale, right? So that's interesting. Um, but what we typically find then is that when we talk to organizations, um, so when we talk to organizations, um, we typically kind of find that they often do kind of struggle with some of these things and they, need little, they do need a little bit more support, um, even though kind of the data tell us is that people are pretty good at this stuff. Um, the other thing really is that I wanted to mention is just the team approach, right? So we always mention this team approach and we do that um, because right, it is obviously important to have insight from different people across the organization that can speak to different things, but also um, hope some of the things that we think is that it might also kind of address some of these, you know, these kind of pre previous points I made about the things that, things that we know about, you know, overthinking or um, taking more time than needed or differences in gender um, when it comes to self-assessment. Um, the last thing about change over time um, and the point about, you know, us being better or being more accurate the second time around, we've also seen that in our work. Um, so sometimes at some of our projects, we've done OSA um, kind of at two different time points. And sometimes what we see is that at the second time around, scores may go down. Um, so it actually looks like they are kind of doing worse than what they, you know, than, than where they started. But really the idea is that, you know, the second time around, people often are more accurate and do have a better understanding of what's being, you know, asked. And um, this is something that we, that we have seen, and this is consistent with the research, right, that shows that accuracy and kind of level of understanding of these things do improve um, over time. 
So the next module is really going to go into a deep dive of how to complete and how to use the data gap assessment tool. Um, there's going to be two versions that are available. There will be an Excel tool and then there will be a, um, a PDF. Um, and Chris is going to go over those in detail um, the next module. But again, this data gap assessment tool is really organized into these six main, main domains and it maps directly on to, if you may remember, or if you haven't yet checked it out, I do encourage you to check out modules one and two, um, where we talk about the data matrix and going over kind of these overall agency, this finance, this HR and staffing, quality and compliance, population served and outcomes. So in total, the data gap assessment tool is 60 questions. Um, that map across all those domains that have responses with either no, in progress or partial or yes. And when it is completed, it does provide domain scores and provides you with areas of strengths, so things that you and your organization do really well, and then some of the data gaps and things that you should work on. So some just some tips or things about things to keep in mind when we're completing the data gap assessment tool. And Chris will go into you know, more in the next module about our recommended approach but just some things to also keep in mind is really thinking about feedback, right? So feedback is the main way to address kind of this accuracy issue when it comes to self-assessment. So getting feedback from others can increase accuracy by maybe highlighting some of our blind spots. And again, this is one of the areas, one of the reasons why we do recommend this team approach and really bringing in other people's perspectives. The other piece is just really to reminder to be open, to be honest with yourself, and think critically about what, are, what strengths and weaknesses are for your organizations, right? Remember, we're all not great at everything and that's okay, um, but being really honest about it um, does provide us with some helpful information. Um, take a break if needed, right? So complete the assessment, take a break, and then maybe get back together and look at it again. Um, it is 60 questions. We don't anticipate it taking too long, but um, you know, if you are going through it and you are getting tired or getting distracted, we do recommend kind of taking a break um, and then going back. And then finally, don't overthink it. Um, your initial reaction is probably right. So I'd say trust your gut and go with the first response um, that you kind of thought of. Um, and like I said before, the next module really is going to focus on how to complete this tool um, and a bunch of more details about it um, will be talked about. So thank you so much um, for joining. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, um, you may please send them to the email listed on the screen and we will get back to you. So thank you again so much. Um, hope you enjoyed today's presentation and we will speak to you next time. Thank you. And thank you actually for that overview. That's a really um, important view of uh, how to do a self-assessment and uh, bear all those lessons in mind as you go through the, uh, the tool, which I'll be going through in the next module. Thank you, Ashley. Great, thanks everyone.